So uh, welcome to our first 10-year anniversary celebration <laughs> of Seraphan Chem H, um, which as most of you surely know is an acronym that stands for Chemistry, Engineering, and Medicine for Human Health, and that's the H. Um, I am so honored and excited uh, to be here welcoming all of you to this celebration. Um, we have so much uh, to cheer for, so much to be thankful for, and so much to look forward to as well. Uh, just because uh, nobody's introducing me, so I'll introduce myself. <laughs> um, for people who are new to the community, I'm Carolyn Bertozzi. I'm the director of Sarah Fan Chem H and also faculty in the chemistry department uh, with courtesy appointments in chemical and systems biology and in radiology. Um, I have a long-standing interest, really, since the early days of my graduate studies in the magic that can happen when you bring disciplines together and straddle the interface. And historically for me, that's been the interface of chemistry and biology. And when I moved uh, from UC Berkeley, where I started my career and basically did research for almost 20 years, then moved here in 2015, uh, my goal was to expand my own horizons uh, beyond chemistry and biology to include learning more about engineering sciences and, of course, clinical sciences. And ChemH is the institute that gave me the opportunity of a lifetime uh, to come here and grow as a researcher and a scientist and to help contribute to this amazing community that I'm seeing before me in this room. So um, let me just spend my time here just kind of celebrating with you um, all the achievements uh, of ChemH since our inception 10 years ago. And then I'll conclude with a brief overview of what we'll be experiencing today, which is basically an amazing lineup of speakers, scientists, faculty, trainees, posters, and a keynote lecture by the great David Baker, who's joined us from the University of Washington and is shrinking here in the second row. <laughs> um, so without further ado, Let's talk about what brought us all together in the first place, the fundamental mission of Seraphan Chem H. Um, what, are, what we are about is creating a hub of innovation that brings the power of diversity to bear on the most important and challenging problems in human health. And diversity is the word that describes our superpower as an institution. We aim to engender diversity across every different axis you could imagine that makes a difference in our effort to improve human health. That starts with diversity of disciplines. So ChemH has brought together life sciences, physical sciences, clinical sciences, engineering. And in order to make the most of that multidisciplinary capability, we also need a diversity of people. People with different backgrounds in their training, in their life experiences, in their geographical origins, in their self-identities. People who can come together with all of the ideas and all of the brain power and the mind share that you need to tackle really important, difficult problems like improving human health. So it all started with our founding director, Chaitan Koshla. And we have celebrated him many times, but this is such a special occasion, I would like to take a moment for a round of applause for the person who came up with the idea in the first place, Chayton. He's, he's a humble person and doesn't like too much attention. <laughs> but um, he's the person who recognized that Stanford was poised for a revolution in the way that we do biomedical research. And Stanford is so unique in having world-class basic sciences, engineering, and clinical sciences all on one campus with incredible proximity. And this building, I think, really exemplifies the centrality of sciences and, and medicine at Stanford because all of us can probably look out the window and point to our offices and laboratories from this central site. So Stanford was really the only place that you could conceive of building an institute like ChemH that would leverage all of these capabilities. And he pitched that idea to the leadership at that time, 
which of course was a different leadership than we have now. So the former president, uh, which was John Hennessy, the former provost, John Etchemendy, the former dean of research, Ann Arvin, and then all of the deans of the relevant schools, the School of Medicine, Humanities and Sciences, and Engineering. And every single one of those leaders heard his pitch and realized that that was the time and it was time to make the investment and that Chaitin was the person to lead that idea. So he founded the institute with the goal of hiring exceptional faculty that would bring this vision of diversity to campus and create a culture of collaboration, idea sharing, and openness. That we would train a new type of student and the students trained at ChemH would be fluent in more than one scientific language, a so-called multilingual scientist and physician scientist. And then build a research community that brings people from all across campus together to talk about how we leverage each other's skills and ideas to move the needle on human health. So his first order of business was to bring people to campus who could supplement the already very strong representation in chemistry, biology, and medicine. And I was very fortunate to get the call from Chaitin uh, back in the year 2013 when I was comfortably ensconced at UC Berkeley. I had no gripes with my institution, perfectly happy. But when he explained to me, first of all, what the vision was, and then he dropped the little bomb that Peter Kim was going to join the institute, my ears pricked up, and I realized that this could be the opportunity of a lifetime. So Peter and I uh, were the first two senior faculty recruitments to join the fledgling institute. And at the same time, Chaitin had launched junior faculty searches that brought the great Polly Fordyce and the amazing Stanley Chi into our presence. And they are now also senior tenured faculty uh, who are helping, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, have really done so much to help us sculpt the culture and the science uh, in our fledgling institute way back in 2014. We then brought in Ling Yin Lee, who was our first faculty representative in the biochemistry department, concurrent with Peter Kim. And Ling Yin brought an amazing sensibility of chemistry and biology together in her work on cancer immunology to be followed by another senior recruitment, which was Michael Fishbach, who we plucked right out of UCSF and brought him down here to the brighter side of the Bay Area <laughs> uh, to help us build an, a, a microbiome sciences initiative. And we had then two more junior recruitments, the phenomenal John Long and the incredible Laura Dasama. Uh, and Laura was really wonderful for me because she is my also colleague in my department, in the chemistry department. We then brought in a junior faculty, Monther Abu Ramela, who's my cherished lab suite mate in the ChemH building, and senior faculty recruit Christine Jacobs Wagner, who brought microbiology into our institute with her own unique flair. Uh, and by the way, Christine was also a product of Stanford training, like so many people that we have in our presence. During COVID, amazingly enough, we really had a boom like year of recruitment. We got busy from Zoom and were able to recruit the incredible Stephen Bannock, who I had gotten to know up close and personal as he was a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory. And he was you know, the hot ticket on the market that year for chemistry departments. And we fought very hard to keep him here as a ChemH scholar. Um, the recruitment of Christopher Barnes, which actually had a two-year history <laughs> prior to his final agreement to join us, um, we worked so hard to, to secure who at that time was really the leading face of COVID structural biology. And we brought him here and he has infused all kinds of energy into our cryo EM capabilities. We fought to recruit Nathaniel Gray uh, away from Harvard and the Dana-Farber. Let me tell you, Harvard is a place that's hard to extract people from, <laughs> unless you are Seraphan Chem Age. <laughs> and then I'd like to think it was a no-brainer for Nathaniel, shrinking here in the second row as well. <laughs> and then finally, we recruited our first physician scientist in the embodiment of the great Paul Michel. And Paul has taught us so much about what it takes 
to get basic science out of the laboratory into the clinic and how you connect the science with the physician and the patient. So we're learning so much from him. And then capping it off, our most recent recruits are Hawa Tiam and Nicole Martinez. Yeah, a one-two superpower punch of scientists that span physical sciences, immunology, molecular sciences, from proteins to lipids to nucleic acids. So excited uh, to have these two faculty, brand new and amongst us. So just to put some numbers on our accomplishments over the last decade, um, I really do think that we have altered the fabric uh, at Stanford and hopefully in the world at large in terms of human health research. So we have 17 scholars that we've recruited so far. They are affiliated with 10 different departments across the campus. They have been recognized with so many honors and awards that we just can't list them individually, but there's more than 80 of them now on our list from the last decade. Together, we have published over 500 papers. We have had filings for more than 30 patents. We, in the last 10 years, have started more than 14 companies in 10 years from our one fledgling institute. And most importantly, we have contributed to the training and mentoring of over 350 of those bilingual scientists that will go on and amplify our impact substantially over the next years. And here's some of the people doing work here. You can see Chayton and John are debating some scientific topic of interest. I don't know what it is. Uh, but here are some of the companies that we've spun out, just to point out some names. Uh, and I'll point out that Paul Michel is the lead scientist on a $25 million cancer grand challenge grant, a multi-PI, multi-institution grant, which is now associated with ChemH. And I'm so proud uh, to be able to show things like that on this slide. So training is a central core component of our mission. And since the inception of our institute, we have built a number of training programs uh, for students across the gamut of undergraduates, postgraduates, PhD, and of course, postdoctoral trainees as well. So one of our signature programs, which was my first order of business when I arrived here, was to create a graduate program to serve the needs of the new type of student that we want to train. So that's now called the Chemistry Biology Interface, or CBI, pre-doctoral training program, for which we secured an NIH training grant, a T32, as well as some incredibly generous philanthropic contributions from many of the friends and family of Stanford University. And so many students have now come into this program and graduated from the program that it's really now you know, highly and regarded and well recognized across uh, the scientific community. In 2014, we created our first undergraduate entrepreneurship program where we gave undergrads the opportunity to come up with a new startup company idea and to pitch it to actual venture capital volunteers from Silicon Valley and to be mentored by these people as they actually tried to do research to seed the ideas of their company during the summer. And that was a lot of fun. We also created a, a, a seed grant program for what we called Postdocs at the Interface. This was a program where we invited postdocs from two different labs to meet each other, come up with a research idea, and then we would give them a grant. And it was one of our ideas for what I like to think of as benevolent social engineering Right, where you try to get people you know, together to foster interactions and discussions, and who knows what will come out of it. But lots of really interesting new projects came out of these initiatives, initiated entirely by the postdocs. Now, in 2018, we have a new undergraduate scholars program, which gives undergrads research opportunities, as well as mentorship opportunities and career advancement opportunities. And in 2021, I'm really excited, uh, we partnered with the Innovative Medicines Accelerator Program, which is now led by Chayton, uh, to create a post back program where we can bring recently graduated undergrads to Stanford and give them two years of research opportunity. And the idea is to take students who did not have access to top-notch research environments in their undergraduate training, but aspire to go to graduate school at some point, and the post back program gives them the opportunity to do research at an R1 institution of our caliber, as well as mentorship and training so that they can 
do well on their GREs, write NSF, you know, fellowship applications, and basically compete for slots in the top PhD programs, hopefully Stanford being among them. So we have so much to celebrate for all of these students, and here's, this is one of our annual retreat photos for the CBI program. Uh, these are a bunch of undergrads in the Undergrad Scholars Program. Uh, here's post back students presenting their work at a poster session, uh, and hopefully you'll get a chance to meet some of these trainees at our poster session later today. So the CBI program, I think, has, has had a pretty big impact on the makeup of the biomedical workforce, even in these first 10 years of its existence. So of our nine cohorts, we've trained a total of 108 students. That's, that's, that's a pretty big number. 30 of those people have already graduated and are out in the world in their own careers. They worked for 53 different faculty members from 27 different departments. And one of the metrics that we use to sort of judge you know, whether we're changing the fabric of research at Stanford is, is to look at numbers like this. So each of the CBI students comes into a home department for their PhD. And then by virtue of being a CBI student, they get exposure to labs in lots of other departments around campus. And our finding is that almost two thirds of these students end up joining a thesis lab in another department outside of their home department or at least jointly with a faculty member in another department. So these students are basically forming connections between faculty who might not otherwise even have met each other being on different sides of campus in different departments. But the students bind them together with new project ideas, new collaborations, new relationships, and I think this is a wonderful way to look at the type of community that we've built through this program. And we're also proud of the fact that we've been able to recruit into this program a reasonably diverse cohort of students with good gender balance and good representation from people who typically identify as being from underrepresented groups. There's more work to do here. I think we could do even better. But the fact that our numbers look better than the average department numbers tells us that we're doing at least something positive in terms of recruiting the most diverse students to our campus that we can. Let me also tell you about the Knowledge Centers, and, and many of you have heard me talk about what an amazing resource uh, these facilities are. But for those of you who are newer to the community, Knowledge Centers are one of the signature inventions of Serifan Chem H. And Chayton, once again, gets the credit for understanding the value of these kinds of facilities. These are research centers that are led by world-class senior scientists who have experience from the biopharmaceutical industry. And these are centers where we invite trainees to come and learn new skills, new capabilities, many of which relate to drug discovery. For example, the first knowledge center that we developed was the Medicinal Chemistry Knowledge Center back in 2013. Even before I arrived, this knowledge center was getting off the ground. And this is a place where a person can come and learn how to make molecules. They can learn the process of converting a hit molecule to a lead molecule and ultimately to a drug prototype. And this is wonderful for biologists who don't have the capability in their own labs of making molecules because now there's a group of people they can work with who are dedicated to collaborating with them and other faculty across campus. Next, we developed our macromolecular structure knowledge center where we help students and postdocs and faculty solve the structures of their proteins by x-ray crystallography or cryo-EM, a wonderful capability for drug discovery and basic science. We also built a metabolomics knowledge center for mass spectrometry-based metabolite profiling, and they also do some proteomics work. And then fast forward a few years, and during COVID, we managed to basically reinvigorate the campus high throughput screening facility and now operate it like a knowledge center. And most recently, we built a protein engineering knowledge center. And both of these two knowledge centers we built in collaboration with the Innovative Medicines Accelerator, which of course is supporting academic drug discovery programs here at Stanford. And in case you haven't met them, uh, this is the all-star lineup of the directors of these facilities. These are world-class scientists 
who basically have a career track at Stanford, which is a new thing for academia. We think of our knowledge center directors as being every bit as independent and visionary as a Stanford faculty member, just on a parallel career track, which is focused more around collaboration and training. So Mark Smith runs our MedChem Knowledge Center. We originally, we poached him away from Roche. Uh, Daniel Fernandez runs the crystallography component of our Structural Biology Knowledge Center. And he has a very close collaboration with Slack, who is a partner with us in these knowledge centers. Um, we have Yu Chin Dai, who we poached away from Agilent, running our Metabolomics Knowledge Center. Bruce Koch, who is now overseeing the High Throughput Screening Knowledge Center, also came from a background at Roche. And our most recent addition is Adrian Hugenmatter, who's Protein Engineering Director, also from Roche, but Roche over in Basel, Switzerland. And we're actually going to hear, a, a, I think we have a poster presentation today from uh, Hao Ching Wang, who's brand new, and he's overseeing our cryo-EM component of the Macromolecular Knowledge Center. So uh, you'll actually get to meet him in the flesh today if you are interested in that. Okay. So what are the metrics of impact of our knowledge centers? Well, we can put some numbers on that too. So our five knowledge centers have contributed to over 100 publications in the last decade. And many of our knowledge center directors are co-authors on these publications because of their intellectual contributions. And they have worked with 47 faculty co-authors from 24 different departments. So these are knowledge centers that are impacting really the entire campus of people interested in biomedical research. Um, a few more milestones here. We have had some really great uh, moments where we launched new initiatives that incubated in ChemH. For example, uh, in 2019, with the arrival of Michael Fishbach, we launched the so-called Microbiome Therapies Initiative. And that included Michael securing a philanthropic gift that has allowed him to basically take communities of microbes and scale them into new therapeutic candidates. We helped launch the IMA, and this was the moment where Chaitin transitioned from being the director of Serafan ChemH, handed that baton to myself, and then became the director of this new IMA. We had a big party here. Do you remember this? This was February 2020, <laughs> before COVID. We were just on the horizon of having to shut down our newly opened building. And here we were gathering very close together without any separation. You know. Uh, hope, hopefully we didn't spread any COVID in those early days, but um, it was a, a really exciting moment when we opened the building for business. Porter Drive is now a satellite site that houses much of the IMA research activity, as well as some of our expansion activities from ChemH, including people from the Microbiome Therapeutics Initiative. And most importantly for me this week, um, not that long ago, it was just in 2022, we had the amazing naming gift from the great Lily Serafan, who unfortunately couldn't join us today because of some of her business commitments, but I had the great pleasure of sharing an evening with her last night at Mark Tessier Levine's presidential house where we had a dinner and had our, our own independent celebration. But when Lily partnered with us to basically give us funds to help operate the institute and to realize our vision uh, and also to name the institute, um, I realized that we had an incredible partner who, you know, will be very closely connected with us, you know, throughout her life, presumably. And also she, I think, is a great person whose name bestows a lot of um, gravitas on what we do. And if, if you're not familiar with the, the background and the accomplishments of Lily Serafan, do a Google search. You'll find her Wikipedia page and you can read all about the incredible stuff that she's done before age 40. Okay, she's incredibly young. Um, we also created this logo in partnership with her. And if you're curious what this symbolizes, um, you'll notice, first of all, um, there's multiple colors in this beautiful butterfly logo. And the colors uh, signify the interdisciplinarity of the institute and all of the different types of science that converge here. You'll notice also the shape of the butterfly, uh, which is meant to evoke thoughts of creativity, freedom, beauty. And I think that also is a wonderful symbol for our institute. So we owe her a great debt of gratitude in so many ways. OK. Um, then COVID happened. <laughs> and you know, at ChemH, when 
things started to go south and we realized that we were dealing with a global pandemic and a human health emergency, we got together and asked ourselves, what can we do to contribute to the COVID response? And there was so much going on here, I, we can't do it all on one slide, but I just wanted to point out a few things. First of all, you know, we had recruited Peter Kim back in 2013. And many of you know that prior to his arrival here, Peter ran Merck Research Labs. So he was the head of research at Merck. And during his tenure at Merck, among his many accomplishments was to basically create a world-class vaccinology program. He had a long-standing interest in vaccines, HIV vaccines, and when he was at Merck, they developed Gardasil, which of course is the world-changing vaccine for HPV. So here he was amongst us in Serifan Chem H, the COVID pandemic hit, we couldn't have asked for a better person to lead a new effort, a uniquely Chem H style effort in vaccine development. And he did that and he's been publishing incredible papers on his own homegrown vaccine construct, which is a durable, low cost vaccine that could be deployed around the world without the need for cold supply chains. So of great benefit in locations where the mRNA vaccines and the adenovirus-based vaccines really cannot be deployed. We also had Stanley Chi in our midst, who is a world leader in CRISPR-based technologies. And he used his superpower to come up with new COVID tests, as well as new ideas for therapeutics that target COVID at the genetic level, rather than, for example, at the protein level. We also were able to raise money from generous donors to build a brand new state-of-the-art biosafety level three, a BSL-3 facility, which is actually situated in Keck Hall. It's one of the chemistry buildings. And there's a whole background to that, which I won't go into. But, but basically, this positioned us at Stanford to now do world-class research in BSL-3 pathogens like COVID, SARS viruses, as well as other important global pathogens like tuberculosis. So many research themes have emerged quite organically from the ChemH ecosystem. Uh, and you'll see here examples of research initiatives that have launched out of ChemH. You'll hear about some of these later today in the presentations of faculty and alumni and trainees. Um, but I'll point out a few examples that you won't get to hear about later. For example, Lara Dasama has led the charge in using structural biology to come up with new ways of treating rare diseases. One example. Um, I mentioned Michael Fishbach, who has launched this microbiome initiative. And quite recently, uh, he showed that you could actually make skin microbiome-based cancer therapeutics. So that's an amazing uh, invention from ChemH. Over here in the anti-infective space, Christine Jacobs-Wagner has done some brilliant work showing us new avenues to develop therapeutics against microbes. And Jonathan Long has figured out at the metabolic level what happens when we exercise that leads to appetite suppression. It's a well-known phenomenon, but the molecular basis of this was a total mystery until Jonathan discovered a metabolite in blood, which is like a dipeptide that seems to be a central player in that physiology. Incredible. So what's going to be on the horizon for the next 10 years? Um, more than we can cover in one minute, but I'll just put some ideas out there so that you kind of know what we're thinking. Um, first of all, we spent a lot of time in our first decade fleshing out the faculty and the trainees that could bring chemistry, engineering, and medicine together. And I think now, in the next decade, we're going to be really focusing on how we move the needle in the H part, which is the human health. In other words, now how can we focus on strengthening the bridges between our institute and physicians, doctors and their patients? And can we bring them into the virtuous cycle of discovery and intervention? We have three more faculty slots to fill, so we're not done there yet. I should point out that uh, we do have a faculty member who's basically on approach, and that is David Cox, who's an MD, PhD, He's currently uh, doing his residency, but he'll be joining the ChemH faculty in 2025. So keep your eyes out for David. But we'll also be running searches for the last three faculty scholar positions that will occupy the ChemH building. And as a preview, at least two of those faculty hires will be done jointly with IMA. And we would like 
either all or most of them, uh, to be affiliated with departments in the School of Engineering, just to make sure we have the balance that we want at the end of the day. So that will happen. We also have made some progress in forming alliances with parties outside of academia. And that includes alliances with big pharmaceutical companies as well as with investment firms that want to put money into innovative drug development programs. And we already have alliances now with, for example, Invis and Deerfield, but we see opportunities for even more of these sort of strategic relationships. And then finally, there are so many new institutes doing interesting things that have touch points with human health that we want to think strategically about how we could partner with them. For example, we have the new Knight Initiative for Brain Resilience, which came out of the Wusai Neurosciences Institute. And we think there's a lot of synergy between ChemH interests and interests at the Knight Initiative. Same with the Wusai Human Performance Alliance, which is a new initiative on campus. And the brand new sustainability school, we know that there is an intersection between sustainability and human health. And what can we contribute to that from the molecular sciences scale at ChemH is something that we would like to explore. So with that, um, let me just give you a quick preview of what's to come for the rest of the day. Um, after my talk, you're going to hear the keynote lecture from David Baker, and he'll be introduced shortly. And then we'll have a presentation from uh, our first junior faculty recruit to ChemH, now tenured professor Polly Fordyce. Uh, then we're going to have um, a lunch slash poster session, and there's more details about the posters in your brochure, so you can get a preview there. Then in the second session, which is after lunch, we're going to hear presentations from a whole lineup of incredible people. Uh, new assistant professor Nicole Martinez will be presenting, as well as two alumni uh, from Stanford. So Erin Chen was a postdoc in Michael Fishback's lab, and she's a new faculty member at the Broad Institute at MIT. Flew all the way back here just to celebrate with us today. This is really exciting. And then Andrew Yang, he was an early graduate student in the CBI program who worked in Tony Weiss-Corey's lab. So I think he was a chemistry student. So he's a person who went out of his department for his PhD thesis. He's now an independent Sandler fellow at UCSF, very prestigious program there. Uh, and so he commuted back down to celebrate with us today as an alum. And then finally, we'll hear from three current trainees that are affiliated with Stanford ChemH. So Melissa Gray, she's a postdoc in Stephen Bannock's lab. Uh, Roman here is a postdoctoral fellow in Nathaniel Gray's lab. And then Uche is a graduate student in the CBI program uh, working in Monther's lab. And then it's going to come home in style. So this is like the lineup for the ninth inning. Couldn't ask for a better lineup here. Uh, new assistant professor Hawa Tiam will present, as well as one of our early junior faculty hires, now tenured professor Ling Yin Lee. And then bringing it home, you know, clutch, bottom of the ninth, Peter Kim himself, the very first recruitment, actually, I think, to ChemH, even before myself. So with that, um, let me just take one second to thank this group of people. Um, this was the committee that put together this program. Uh, so Christine Jacobs-Wagner, Monther, Abu Ramela, Stephen Bannock, and John Long, Thank you so much for all the hard work you did to bring everyone together on this beautiful day. A round of applause for our organizers. And amazingly enough, I've only blown the schedule by five minutes. <laughs> so with that, I will now turn over the podium to Stephen Bannock, who is going to introduce our keynote lecturer. Stephen. <laughs> 